dear, where to start? Um, I just wanted to know, because it's not actually something we ever talked about, um, when did you first think about becoming an artist? And what do you think that, what did you think then that meant? What did it mean to be an artist when you were a young person? Well, I think I had uh, the opportunity. I grew up on a farm in Northern Virginia outside of Washington, D.C. And um, I spent summers with my grandmother in New York. So I had a rich landscape that I was exposed. Oh, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Delaware Water Gap. This was. Um, when I was at PCA, I had a summer scholarship for artists for environment. And these paintings were all landscape based. And I'm not going to talk about the slides <laughs> after this, I promise. <laughs> yes, there, you are. there are many, and they're just going to keep rotating. But they are in chronological order. And there'll be some surprises, and there'll be some funny pictures. And most of them are paintings and drawings. But anyway, so um, I had the opportunity to, to go between uh, Northern Virginia and New York. And my grandmother in New York was able to expose me to a lot of great things in museums. And she was a very eccentric, um, creative person. Um, but I think in March of 1967, I had the opportunity to meet Louise Nevelson. And I had lunch with her and, um, in the West Village in New York. And um, she was a pretty magnificent female artist to meet in real life. Obviously, most of you probably know who she is or was. And um, she had a show up at the Whitney Museum at that time. So I was able to get to know her through a lovely Italian uh, meal and to walk through the museum with her and see her work. So I think that was kind of an obvious big moment. Um, but then. Just several months after that, I went to the Philadelphia College of Art and studied with you. And I think that once I had that summer in high school uh, and exposure to art school, there was no going back. I just wanted to be a painter. I'm going to backtrack and say that Wendy spent, I guess, two months in the summer at a summer program at. Uh, I was in the Philadelphia College of Art. And um, I think I taught two summers, and she's the only student I actually remember. So that <laughs> says something. Um, and we have stayed in touch one way or another ever since then. And I also did have the, during the course of working on this project, spent a day watching her function as a teacher, and she is pretty amazing. So she was an amazing student, and she yeah. is an amazing teacher. Um, and I think so many people in the audience know that because of their own personal experience with her as a teacher, from what I could tell. So it's great that you're all here to celebrate her. Um, so let's move on to the notion of feminism. <laughs> and talk about how you were impacted by the 1970s and how you've kept going. Um, the Philadelphia College of Art actually had a lot of women teachers. And so by being a student there as an undergraduate when she came back, it was not that unusual to have women around. At least that was my experience earlier than yours. So, talk yeah, about I had that. an entirely different experience. I only worked with you and Cynthia uh, Carlson, um, and I didn't work with any women at the University of New Mexico. So, um, most of the influences were the male teachers. Um, but I have to say. When I graduated from the University of New Mexico in 1974, I moved to Taos and lived there for a year. And that's when I really sort of got my hands on feminism, because I was free. And I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. And I have a great magazine I want to share with everybody. 
This is Art Forum. Uh, this is a collector's item. Get ready. From 1974, this is Linda Benglis who took out an ad in Art Forum magazine. And it was a pretty wild thing for her to do at the time. And when I looked at this image, um, I thought, I guess I don't want to spend the rest of my life in northern New Mexico. I need to head back as beautiful it, as it was and as great of an impact that it had on my work, my sense of color and light. I, I mean, I, I had to get back to the East Coast. So, um, but this was really an important moment for me as well as I have all these things in my archives. <laughs> the first feminist art journal, first issue, uh, Heresies, and um, the Women's Art Journal. So, you know, for all the teaching positions that I had, I, as, as Leslie mentioned, I, I was the first woman hired in all male departments. And, um, you know, that was a really tough situation. So I fought hard to hire more women and minorities. That was my goal. And um, it took a lot of uh, strength and pain and energy. So what about students? I mean, when I was a grad student at Penn, I was the only female in my class. So who were the, what was the student body I you think were with? that I think, um, you know, the data is kind of strange. At that time, uh, there were more female students, but then they'd graduate and then they wouldn't get the jobs. And at the University of New Mexico, Garrow Antresian, um, who was, you know, the king of lithography, um, and several other people uh, had a conversation with the women who were coming out of school with their master's degrees. And we said, you know, you need to pay more attention to us. Why are you feeding all the men these teaching positions? And so they heard us and they reacted. And so there really was a, uh, uh, a significant group of women hired out of the University of New Mexico in academic institutions across the United States. But I think, you know, my first teaching job was a part-time job at the University of Texas in San Antonio. And um, I got that because Charles Field, who had taught me in New Mexico, invited me out to teach there. You've taught pretty steadily. Um, there, are, there are those people who um, as soon as they... You have to turn around and look at this. Yeah. This, I'm sorry, I have to tell you, this is our loft in New York. <laughs> That's Georgia, who's right here. <laughs> She's only 34 years old now. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, you've been a teacher, and you've been a mother. And, uh, from the, I would say thousands, not hundreds of works we went through in thinking about your exhibition, um, it doesn't seem to have slowed you down any. So how have you juggled your various roles throughout all of these years? I think, you know, this was such an emotional experience for me. Well, this is just seeing so many people here, but also um, going through all my work with you and Joanne over the past nine months. Um, because I didn't, know how much work I had done. I mean, there was so much that I'd forgotten about. And um, once I decided I wanted to have a baby, and Georgia was born in New York, and then I started commuting back and forth from New York to Brown, um, I just had to work like crazy. I mean, I just didn't sleep much, and I had to get tenure, I had to show, so um, I didn't want to lose my identity. I was very fearful of that. I loved being a mother. <laughs> but um, I, th I think it was a, a very conscious choice on my part. And um, I was lucky 
and grateful that I had a great teaching position. Um, but, you know, I still had to gain tenure and I, I still needed to show the work and it just kind of kept rolling. Yeah, but you don't strike me as uh, someone who was dying not to be teaching, that you really love teaching. And so I'm kind of trying to get at the oh. relationship between being a teacher and being a mother and being an artist, all of which you've been successful at. And so how did you, so many people complain they can't do everything. Yeah, and we can't do everything. I, I think, um, well, I never thought I was going to be a teacher anyway. I didn't know I'd go into education. I just thought I'm going to be a painter and live in New York. Um, and so when I took this job, I thought, nah, Brown's not, you know, it's next to RISD. You know, you've heard me complain. <laughs> and I, there was no graduate program here. I'd left Madison, Wisconsin. That was a great graduate program um, where happily I met Jerry. And, um, you know, I just, I felt like I wouldn't stay here. And then I really um, got drawn into this university at large. I had friends in other departments. Um, I think I was inspired by so much that the university offered me that, um, you know, I ended up staying much longer than I ever expected to. But teaching, I mean, I guess I really do love teaching. I think it's probably, you know, when I was teaching in San Antonio, I was teaching in three different places. I was teaching mostly um, Hispanic kids in a community college and at the University of Texas in San Antonio and the McNay Art Institute. So I had exposure to a really diverse group of students, and as, as I did when I was a TA at the University of New Mexico. So coming to Brown at first, this was a pretty white dominated, you know, wealthy joint. And I didn't feel comfortable here. So, you know, it is a changed institution, that's <laughs> for sure. And, um, and I think that the students have always been really brilliant and energetic and motivated. So, you know, it's kind of easy to teach people who want to learn. Fair enough. Plus, you know, <laughs> Leslie, yeah, I am kind of pushy, so, <laughs> you know, I get them to do stuff. All right, let's switch to the art. Um, talk a little bit about the relationship between the works on paper and the paintings, how they function together separately. Um, okay, so I do think, I've always done things kind of backwards. I need to make paintings before I make the drawings. So I don't do preparation drawings sometimes, but not very often. I feel like I can kind of dive into a large scale work and discover something. I mean, most of this stuff is very internalized. Um, and after, you know, a few paintings or a series of paintings are finished and resolved, then I'll go back to works on paper and those will reflect what was going on in the paintings. So, um, and you know what? Maybe that has to do with Sam Gilliam. I'm just wondering. Because when I was in high school, Joanne mentioned that I was fortunate enough to, to study with this young black uh, painter who was doing very radical work, work at the time. And um, so he sort of introduced me to um, spilling paint and uh, a more focused, uh, abstract direction. So when I went to PCA, it became a little bit more traditional, actually. Um, but paper, you know, I've had so many more shows, including paintings rather than drawings, and, and looking through those thousand pieces on paper with you and Joanne, uh, you know, they're very wonderful intimate things for me. I love them. You know, it's like writing. It's poetry. It's, um, it just feels, you know, uh, intimate and immediate on another level. It's not wet like paint for the most part. And, you know, I do like really wet, cushy paints, so. Well, I've always thought that works on paper were the most important works. Um, 
Do you have any response to that as an idea? Well, that's because that's your bias, Ruth. It is my bias. You know, you're an expert. It's grown to be it's my bias. Field. It's grown to be my bias because of my experience. So now argue with me. <laughs> um, oh, God. You know, the problem is there really is this hierarchy, maybe, you know, of paintings and then drawings and prints. And, um, and there really don't need to be those hierarchies anymore. I think those things have pretty much been destroyed. Um, I don't know, the other day I was talking to Leslie, and you know, Leslie and I both sort of have this tendency to really like to make big paintings. It's, it's something that you know, we've sort of um, become accustomed to doing. And I know that comes out of a very male-dominant um, abstract expressionist movement. And I think, in a sense, what, what we're doing is reflecting on that um, work that we'd been exposed to for so long and trying to take, you know, and approach the work from a different angle, from, from a more female point of view. But, um, but I love works on paper. I love books. I like, you know, um, being able to see the vast differences between how you build up a surface on a canvas as opposed to how you build up a surface um, on a piece of paper. Like this is really built up with like maybe 10 layers of um, Senelli pastel and, and they're sprayed. Each layer is sprayed in between. So, but maybe what my problem with drawing is that I'm trying to get closer to painting. I don't think you have a problem with drawing, um, <laughs> actually. <laughs> but um, what's wonderful about the exhibition, I mean, there's a lot that's wonderful about the exhibition, but there are three drawings on one wall that are all iceberg drawings. And what I think is important about having those three drawings in terms of the uh, selections for the exhibition is that every one of those drawings in the entry gallery could pro I mean, some could have 30, some could have 50 maybe. I don't, wasn't counting as I was going along, but all of those drawings have um, lots of examples. And I think that's less the case with the paintings, while there would be series of paintings, the series cool. of paintings are smaller, are fewer in number than the series of drawings. And so I guess what I'm really trying to get at is what the meaning of, I mean, it's not unusual to do more drawings than paintings. I think people who do both generally do more drawings than paintings. But it's what, um, what the function of doing so many drawings has um, done for you, how that's uh, ex expanded what you've done or what you've thought about, well, I, if at all. I, I, think, I think the drawings, I think they're, they're much more intimate. So you, know, you take different risks in different, with different materials. And, um, and I don't think uh, most of the drawings, when I'm making them, I'm not in, the intention isn't to ultimately exhibit them for some goofball reason, right? So, but with the paintings, there is this, you know, more commitment. And, um, and so there could be something more delicate, something more fine, and, um, or sensitive in the drawings. So you must be attracted to the sensitivity. I'm attracted because I think there's a whole different kind of thinking that goes on in working on paper for the reasons that you said. I mean, people don't think they're going to exhibit them. Paper's cheaper than canvas. It's easier to move around. I mean, there are lots of reasons for it. Um, but all those things are what make drawings more interesting to me. But it, we don't have to worry about that. Um, your work adds motifs. Could you talk a little bit of, just about how, you have 40 years worth of paintings out there. Walk us through them a little bit, <laughs> quickly. Because <laughs> we want to leave time for questions. Yeah, okay. And so we're so, not going to talk much more, but walk us through how one thing leads to another. And okay, when it. I came to Brown, I really thought about 
um, where I belonged. And so I made paintings. Actually, they're not even in this show. We didn't include them. I made a whole series of diptychs mapping out where I had lived across the country. Um, and I made images tracing parts of my body, either entering or exiting um, the painting. And those paintings evolved from you know, combining abstraction with the figure into full-blown figurative works. Actually, and only the drawings from that group are, um, are in the show, none of the paintings. And they were like really sensual paintings of uh, figures coupling. Um, and those, in turn, uh, moved into a whole series of paintings based on China. Because I went to China in 1984, which was an early time to be there. And um, I was living in New York. And most of those paintings were vertical. And what I was primarily interested in was I had focused on the southern part of China near Guilin. And that part of China has these beautiful mountains. It's an area and a river, an area where poets and painters have gone for centuries to work and to meditate. So mine didn't look like Chinese Far Eastern paintings, but I sliced them thinking in terms of Eastern and Western sensibilities. And the grid that formed, which sort of represented the rice paddies at the base of those mountains um, ended up looking like the reflections of skyscrapers in New York. So actually, it wasn't intentional. Like a lot of the work isn't intentional. You know, I don't take on this big intellectual uh, concept organizing the paintings ahead of time. You're These not are a very, they're, they're very internalized. Mm -hmm. They're very experience-based mm -hmm. paintings for the most part. So quickly moving on, then I moved through the China series with a whole bunch of them, tons of drawings, tons of paintings. Um, I don't know, I got tenure, then I was promoted very quickly, luckily, and um, I started moving into more images of like big pomegranates and fruits and, and floral, floral images. Um, you want me to keep going? What about the veils? <laughs> the, about veils. the veils. Then the veils happen. Well, actually, the nets. The nets. The nets. The nets. I'll be quick on the this. Nets. But I, I did kind of move into a very serious, um, uh, unhappy moment in my life, depression. And um, so I did this little drawing, which is framed. I, I did it with a ballpoint pen, and I started up in the corner. And I started, I was thinking about, oh, I feel like, you know, everything is shattering around me. And so I just started drawing shattered glass. And then by the end of the drawing, I realized that I had sort of knit this drawing together. And it really looked more like a net. And um, I think that painting, you know, the paintings that followed were very um, therapeutic. They functioned as coverings. They were porous. They were contained. You know, there were a variety of different things. Um, but I was able to extrude the paint and work fairly quickly, but laboriously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, those, those are, I, I, I loved making those paintings. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about your method, the extruding paint, and how well, that started, and yeah. when it stopped? Well, um, I think it, um, it started at McDowell in 1978. And um, I was definitely influenced by Cynthia Carlson, who I studied with at Philadelphia. But I just took a foundation class with her. And one of the last assignments was to do a painting. And when she gave me the critique, she said, why didn't you ever tell me you were a painter, Wendy? It was like I was a loser until she found out I was a painter. Um, but um, it, and that was OK. Currently, there's a wonderful exhibition at the Los Angeles um, Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, based on pattern and decoration movement. And Cynthia is included in that exhibition, and Sam Gilliam is included. So I actually ended up being a part of the pattern and decoration movement, but like the next generation. Um, 
I, I, extruding the paint for me was like taking kitchen tools, um, sort of domestic tools, and applying them to the studio. So I think that also had a very strong sort of feminist grounding mm -hmm. in the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of paint. <laughs> yes, it was. You know, a lot of paint. What about the oil cloth? Does that have feminist overtones as well? I think so. I, you know, I worry about that sometimes because I'm afraid it sort of <gasps> tinges on nostalgia. And it does, I mean, my great grandmother had in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, had a kitchen table and it was covered with a, a, an oil cloth pattern that I re specifically remember. And actually, as a young, my brother and my sister and my sister in law are here, they might remember this. But anyway, um, I sort of had a photographic memory for objects when I was young. So when somebody lost something, they'd always say, Well, where is this? Go ask Wendy. And I'd know where something was. So I, I was very aware of objects and things. And I think in relation to you know, my memory of the oil cloth at my grandmother's, I mean, it was a very tactile. I mean, I remember the smells. I remember the baking, the cooking, the, the heat in the summer, all sorts of things. So I think that that definitely, ref um, all that oil cloth is made in Mexico. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not really my culture. Um, but they're decorative and they're useful and they're rugged and you know when you're a brownie or Girl Scout we used to make sit-upons and uh, we'd cut out oil cloth and put newspaper in between and uh, I guess stitch the edges and then you could sit on the wet ground and your butt wouldn't get wet. Yeah. You'd be on a piece of oil cloth, it was a sit-upon. I never heard of that. Should we Start, you think? I don't know oh, okay. where we are. Are we okay? All right. Um, yeah, yeah, I've got plenty of questions. <laughs> I just think I should give someone else a chance to talk about your travels. It, it seems to oh, okay. me in so many ways your, um, your work is a kind of compendium of all the life experiences, and they just keep getting layered uh, increasingly as you've gotten older and the, so that the complexity of the work is, in, to my mind, is um, it grows. Uh, and some of that is travel, which you've done a lot of. So I'd like you to talk about that and I'd also like you to talk a little bit about uh, Manet and Mirandi. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I like Okay, I'll go back to the extruded paint in relation to uh, Lucky Charm, okay? Because the yellow Lucky Charm painting that's in the exhibition um, is based on um, Joseph, a Joseph Albers painting. And when I studied color, Albers was the main guy who sort of taught me color. He didn't, but other people who had studied with Albers taught me color, color theory, which had a huge impact on me. So. What I wanted to do there um, was to think about, again, taking sort of a domestic tool, but um, reflecting on a male artist who had had a very positive impact on me and many other people, um, and sort of see his work through a different lens. Mm -hmm. um, and so I did that with Manet, I did it with Mirandi. I'd always loved Manet, I'd always loved Mirandi. Um, I love Mirandi's simple, honest flower paintings. There's something so good about an honest painting. And, um, and he, he, he was, he, he always, I could always sort of depend on him for that. Mm -hmm. So to be able to pay homage to him, again, sort of through, uh, a woman's sensibility just developed and grew and grew. Well, what brought Manet and Mirandi together in your mind? Um, well, I needed Manet, I think, because of the richness of the black, and I needed Mirandi because of the lack of contrast. You know, they're two entirely different artists, mm -hmm. and to be able to kind of get pulled into the richness of Manet's black and the peonies and the flowers 
and then to be able to try to quiet down my palate by reflecting on Giorgio Morandi was, you know, just, it was, he had a, a big impact on me. He helped guide me through not being like so raw in mm -hmm. a way. They're small Perfect. paintings compared with most of the other paintings. Well, a lot of Mirandi's paintings were small, so maybe that had something to do with it. Uh, also, um, you know, I, there is a connection between the vases and the flowers. I, I painted the flowers without vases, and then I painted the empty <laughs> vases. And, um, you know, I, I think when you're working with an empty vessel, it, it's sort of symbolic of uh, the body and uh, almost the opposite of, you know, the, this abundance of, of floral stuff that's supposed to go mm -hmm. in it. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the flower, the most recent? paintings in the exhibition Those are Van Gogh, uh, Van Gogh inspired. So how did we get to Van Gogh from? I got to Van Gogh primarily just because the Metropolitan Museum had put a group of his last paintings together that he had done. And um, he was in the sanitarium. And I just was really attracted to the paintings. It was close to the end of his life. He'd made all these great paintings. And I just think I needed to to get closer to those paintings and comment on them. Um, and I wasn't trying to, um, you know, reproduce his color. Nobody could. But um, I wanted to take his shapes and contort them and have them refer more to the body and to organs and to, you know, much more sensual sorts of references. Mm -hmm. I mean, his references were definitely sensual. But um, yeah, again, sort of taking the position of a, of a, a woman looking at a male artist and, and reflecting on, on that work through you know, my eyes, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned uh, Nevelson early on, who besides Nevelson among female artists has been important to you. Oh, there's so many. Well, Elizabeth Murray. I've always loved Elizabeth Murray. Louise Moyon, a French artist who did beautiful little cherries and you know, peaches, Rachel Roish, a, a Dutch painter. Um, yeah, Piero della Francesca, Fra Angelica. They're guys. Yeah, I let them enter into my world. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're all good. <laughs> you know, I think, I think, um, I think Elizabeth Murray was fabulous, so she was mm -hmm. great. I was, I was thinking early on that, you know, for 40 years I've been here introducing other artists, bringing visiting artists to Brown. And um, I've been so fortunate to bring people like Pat Steer, Joan Snyder, Hannah Wilkie, I mean, hundreds of people. And um, having the opportunity to do that and introduce those artists to my students, I think, was, you know, a gift. Mm -hmm. I was very lucky to do that. Um, okay, I think we're now ready to take questions. If people have questions, Joanne, you want to tell us the. We have a couple of mics, one on either side, and we can just ask you to come up to the Where are we? <laughs> I didn't get anybody to plant. I, I should have planted some questions. <laughs> what did I say wrong? <laughs> well, then, if that's the case, I think it's Don't time to. It. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie always gets it going. Okay, Wendy, uh, here we've been talking, talking, and you haven't said the most important thing, and that is about color. Will you please talk about? your relationship to color and what you're doing in your paintings with color. Oh boy, yeah, I, I, I think, well, we've talked about that um, quite a bit. I think that, uh, but not here so much. Um, 
I love color. I feel like color is like the best way one can express oneself, and it just kind of comes to me very naturally. I think some artists, uh, you know, are really primarily focused on line or shape or another material or something, and I just have, it's like I need color in my life. I have color in my life. It's great to work with. I think that, you know, having studied color theory so thoroughly um, when I was uh, in art school helped me a lot. And I also think that, um, you know, I did some hallucinogenic drugs that didn't hurt. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but I think that that really revved up my sense of color tremendously. <laughs> Actually, the great thing about um, coming to the end of my time at Brown, ready for retirement, is I can kind of say anything I want. <laughs> so. Hi, Wendy. I'm just wondering what you have planned next, um, travel, shows, anything on the agenda, or just rest? <laughs> well, um, thanks to Winnie and the team in visual art, they're sort of helping me, guide me out of brown. Um, I think I just really want to be in my studio. And I want to be with my family. And travel. <laughs> but, but my father's 100 and, almost 101, and it would be good to be able to spend more time with him. And to be in Los Angeles with Georgia and Nelson, and, you know, I, I, I think I'll be really busy. <laughs> I guess I'm just taking over from the side. Um, I, maybe it's just more of a, more so some observations, but um, I think I just wanted to comment on, on how drawings are so, I feel like, appealing because they're so raw and direct and feel like there's less at stake when approaching a drawing. I thought it was really interesting to hear that you, that the, the paintings are kind of the locus of maybe the energy and then you, you take from them and then go into the drawings. But it's also nice to see how there's a, almost like a circling back into maybe the more recent work, which I'm seeing coming from the drawings, or maybe from older drawings, sort of a sense of these iconic motifs that, so, or just maybe observation at large, or I'm interested how um, there's been sort of like a dissolution of gravity in your work from the early, more landscape paintings to then the more abstract pieces, but that still retain a sense of an iconic image that feels that it's been so um, absorbed from art history or from the greats that you've been looking at. Um, and then that the netting also, or the net paintings kind of serve as a, almost maybe a prop or a tool to contain maybe that imagery. Um, and that there's still a sense of uh, figure ground relationship in the later works, even though they're much more dissolved. Um, so, and yeah, it was just, it's, having been your student, it's just amazing to see everything um, <laughs> <laughs> displayed in this way, so, yeah. Um, and I just love that the drawings come, I don't know, just the, that process of inversion is really interesting. They're pretty important. Yeah. And I, obviously, having looked at so many hundreds in the past few months, they're just going to be more and more important to me. So, I mean, I do believe you can sit at a kitchen table and not have a gigantic studio and do really important work. So um, that can help to inform everything else. Yeah. I just want to say, I, I mean, I think, you know, there is this wonderful cyclical um, movement through life. It's just so great. Hey, Wendy. Oh. Uh, Hi. I just, I want, I, I'm struck by gesture and movement through the whole series of the slides that you showed. Is that and Sydney? also, yeah, hi, it's me. <laughs> and um, from the very beginning, and um, I, I, and then, and then the image of you on the table. I thought, I was just struck by. Can you just talk about gesture oh, yeah, and that movement? Was, um, in 2017, uh, that was my first trip back to China since 1984. And I was in a master's studio in um, Arumki. And I had the opportunity to work with his materials. And I decided to do a really long piece. 
and I couldn't get to the end of the piece, so I got up on the table. But I don't mean just that in particular. I meant throughout the continuum of all the work you showed, there's just this gestural drawing in oh, your yeah. paintings, and the visual movement of one to the next uh, item, uh, object or form in the image itself it just seems to go through your work throughout the entire breadth of it. I just think it's like my handwriting. Yeah. Uh, okay. Don't you? Probably. Yeah, kind of, but I think it's, it's part of who you are or something. But, you know, movement. it means so much to me, Sydney, to see you because you were here when I first came to I town. remember, yeah, the first woman. It was a huge deal. Mm -hmm. I cracked the place up. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, did, I had no idea what I was getting into, but I also want to thank everybody who came today because so many of you I've known for so long.